informing me that he had finished his biography of Wright, suggesting we resurrect the festival. When the festival stopped in 2007, our motives were that significant members of the festival organizing committee were moving on after 26 years. David Midge Miles to be near their family, our kitchen crew, Jay and Natalie Cruz in Pittsburgh, and Philip and Kathleen Van Boys to their roots in Cass, Missouri, which you can find with a big map. <laughs> Google makes it a lot easier. But we decided that it would be better to end on a high note than to gradually decline. Given that assessment, although I planned, I, I agreed to plan another festival, I was apprehensive concerning finances. As you all know, funding for the arts, which was once very strong nationally in Ohio, has been slowly declining. Resources, personnel, and logistics. Fortunately, I was able to draw on the goodwill of the, fe the festival had accrued and secured two authors whose work I have long admired, Stanley Plumley and Maggie Anderson, both of whom had appeared at three previous festivals. Additionally, at Stanley's suggestion, Dave Lucas, the newly appointed poet laureate of, of the state of Ohio, contacted me and we brought him on board. Thus, with these three poets and the participation of Jonathan and, as always, Andy Wright, we knew we had a strong program. In addition to the assistance of these writers, we were the most fortunate to have the aid of Ohio University's uh, library director, Donna Capizzuto, who has arranged for honor to make sure that all the money was duly recorded. Also, the hospitality and assistance of the Belmont County District Library has been invaluable. Director Anthony Orsini and reference librarian Elizabeth James have put the facilities of the library at our disposal. And then also, I'm sure as you noticed as we came in, there was the James Wright Poetry Festival banner, which was new and a complete surprise to me. Perhaps the most heartening aspect of the resurrection has been the enthusiastic response shown by all of you gathered here. To assemble an audience, I brought back the mailing list we had used 11 years ago and was extremely pleased to find so many of you <coughs> at the same address and eager to participate. The audience, their sense of camaraderie, has been an essential element of the Wright Festival over the years. How many of you are attending for the first time? Really? Okay, great. Well, we welcome you. How many of you for the second time? How many of you? Okay, now I can't. <laughs> <say, laughs> you welcome you also. Apparently, it is true that there are counting systems that go one too many. So, how many of you have been here for many times? <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> That's, this is proof. Galway Canal. Ninety-one. Ninety-one. Uh, that was a great year. Yeah. Um, we deeply appreciate your ongoing support. Housekeeping. So people have name tags. Um, and just as you get older, don't you wish that everybody would name tag? Well? <laughs> <laughs> Even my own. You know, just check down periodically. Um, and should you, wish up, should you wish to do so now, there's, uh, you can still sign up for lunch and dinner. So lunch is $10 and dinner is $20. Um, and then there's a book selling table. And there are no, we don't have facilities for credit card sales, but there's an ATM just down the street at the Unified Bank, so if you just go down here past the Heslop Funeral Home. How many people recognize the Heslop Funeral Home? Okay, good. good. So if you don't, check it out. Um, okay, I guess that's it. Okay, so the open reading is at 1.30, and I'll have a, a table where you can sign up. I'd like you to read one poem, maybe three minutes. I check the blessing takes... 37 seconds. So you can do a lot of it. Sort of a cool, less mechanistic way to assess poetry. Uh, okay, so the 11 o'clock panel is dedicated to a discussion of Jonathan Blunt's biography. From his perspective, Andy Wright will give hers, and then Stanley and Maggie will follow. And, and then after they've given their thoughts, we'd like you to participate in the discussion. Thanks, Tom. Thank you all for coming. I'm so glad that, that, that Stan and Maggie are here with us and David Lucas. What a wonderful workshop this morning. Did many of you take part in that? Uh, it was really, wonder, really wonderful to hear. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I feel like I'm, I'm the unappointed historian of the town in a strange sort of way. <laughs> and I probably know more about this town than some of the other places I've lived in my life. Um, so please, if you, if you can catch me later, if you have questions, I, I might be able to answer. But, but we're here to talk about the biography. I'm very, I'm very proud of the book. It took, it took uh, 
You know, it's a, it's a, it's a Stanley, Stan Plumley asked me uh, last evening how long the book took to write, and, and I think that's a really unfair question because there's about five different answers. I started studying James Wright's work when I was at Cornell University while James was still alive, and I missed the chance to interview him for a thesis I was writing on his translations of Spanish poetry. And he had been traveling with Annie in Europe for nine months. I had met Robert Bly in the summer of uh, 1979. And he encouraged me to introduce myself to James when he returned. He, James took sick very quickly that fall, and he passed away in March of 1980. So in a certain way, having missed the chance to meet him, I was on a, on a it's like I'm still trying to track him down. I mean, that's, that's, that's how it feels at times. And um, in a way, that the work on this book began that long ago. At the, at the Tenth Festival, I don't know how many of you were here at the Tenth Festival. It was a magnificent occasion. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the complete poems above the river had just been published. And I was working on a documentary radio project. And I recorded the entire event. And that was actually the beginning of the, the, of the deep research that goes into this book. Uh, I interviewed many of the poets at that time. Um, I went to graduate school in the mid-1990s. I became friends with Anne at that time, um, at the time of the uh, 10th festival in 1990. And uh, I started doing interviews, uh, thinking that I might be the second biographer of James Wright. Um, and Annie asked me to, to write the authorized biography in 2002. Um, so at that time, we had already begun work on, on the, the Selected Poems volume, uh, the Selected Letters vo volume, excuse me. Um, so that was part of, you know, working with the archives. Are, uh, James Wright's papers are in the University of Minnesota. One of the great ironies of James Wright's life is that his papers would end up at the University of Minnesota. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful facility, and um, I've spent many, many hours there. And, uh, I studied James Wright's books. Uh, he, he loved to put marginalia in the, in the, uh, the margins of his books. Uh, there's, so some of, this, some of this deep study you can see in the pages of the book. The biography, um, I signed a contract for the book in uh, 2008. So there's, you can see there's many different answers for how long it took me to write this book. But, um, the book was twice as long when I finished writing it. So there's a lot of material that, um, that didn't make it into the, into the book. There'll be a scholarly edition available at the archives uh, when I piece it all together, uh, put, it, put it back together again. Many of the pieces that I lost in the final edits of the book, I was able to salvage in a long essay that I've published in the Georgia Review. This is a current volume. Uh, the winter 2017 issue, and I have copies for sale here. I have copies of the biography, a handful of copies uh, that I brought with me, and the selected poems as well. So please see me if, you, if, um, if you're interested in, in purchasing those books. Um, but I'm very happy with the, the, the Georgia Review essay. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot I can say, but I'm, I'm, I do want to leave time to, to open up uh, your your questions about the book and and uh, I want to do you want to speak next, Annie? And do you have anything general to say? Nothing general. No. no? I'm speaking later. <laughs> anything like why did it take you so long? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, I've suppressed that question. I've, I've, for, I've, for I've how many years? <laughs> I've, I've interviewed Annie uh, many hundreds of times. We traveled together, uh, my family and I traveled with her to Tuscany and Italy and all over Italy up to Venice and Verona and Padua. And, and I had a recording, I, I had my recording equipment with me and in sight, we, I, would, I would be pestering Annie with a microphone uh, asking about her, her Remarkable memory, and and being in in the actual places where you visited with James, makes a huge difference because your your memory is, is phenomenal, and it yes. has it still is, <laughs> and uh, but being in sight uh, or in Paris, we traveled to Paris as well. Those those trips were were really essential for the book, and I, and I want to thank you. In Paris, you got to see where we the apartment that we had rented and the study where James used to do his work. Uh, Probably the place he was most happy on he earth. 
<laughs> next to Verona. <laughs> next to Verona. Yeah. Yeah. And Maggie, I've been meaning to thank you for, for a, an article you could brought to my mind in a very clear way what it meant for James Wright to, to grow up in this community and, and how important that conception of an audience, I think, was born here in Martin Sperry, and I think it never left him that all the poems he wrote <coughs> in a way, account for including that audience. A, a sense of kinship that you get from the poems that I think is really remarkable, and it, and it explains why we have a festival in his honor, I think, to a great degree. There's a, there's a, a way in which readers recognize the, not just the genuine honesty that he brings <coughs> to the act of writing a poem, but the inclusiveness, the, 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 the intention that he felt to reach other people. Yeah. Yeah, I th I, uh, one of the things I, I think, obviously he traveled uh, often in his life and he knew languages and he did translations and, um, and all of that made him the great poet he was, but I also would want to say I don't think he would have been the great poet he was if he hadn't been born in Martin Stereo. And, and um, I think those two things are, are crucial. And the essay that you referred to, I, I was not comparing my father to James Wright because my father didn't, didn't write poetry, but he did grow up in a small town in West Virginia along the river, and he did go on to college, and he did uh, have a, a very good memory. He could recite long passages of Shakespeare and Catullus and the Roman poets. He taught Latin and Greek, and I felt the same about him that this little town in West Virginia, Rollsburg, West Virginia, um, was where, where all that energy came from in the beginning, wanting to know, uh, as well as some of the awkwardness of realizing that you know, maybe you're not the same class as some other people. Do. And, and most of my love for James Wright, I think, comes from feeling that affinity um, I'm going to speak a little later about, I, I think there is a sense in which one could call James Wright an Appalachian poet. And I would say that with, you know, heartfelt and um, beloved enthusiasm. I think there are things about his work that are characteristic of other writers from this region. Um, everything else about him, of course, is very unique. But I think that it, it's important to think about what Martin Sperry meant to him and what this region gave to him to make him a poet that he was. Sadly, I never uh, was able to hear James Wright read. Um, but two poets probably who are most important to me in my life are Muriel Wilkaiser and James Wright. And both of them died around the same time in 1980. So I never got to meet or hear either one of them read, which is a sadness. Um, I have, of course, listened to tapes, and his voice is incomparable. It's incantatory, it um, always makes me cry and laugh at the same time. I don't know how I managed that. <laughs> but yeah, I was sorry not to ever get to hearing me, but I certainly, he's one of my central poets, one of the two. <coughs> There's some place in the biography, Jonathan, where you quote a, a, a young woman who came up to him after a reading, I think it was the Marathon William Eberhardt yeah, reading. that's right. Comes up to him and, and says to him, you are my poet. You, you are the one who's putting into words everything I... And I thought about that a lot, because I think I felt something of the same thing when I first started reading him in the 1960s. Um, the other thing I think is, I like that she said, you're my poet. I think everybody has, everybody who knows this work, has a James Wright. There's my James Wright, there's your James Wright. James Wright. <laughs> and I think it's a great tribute to the complexity of a man and a poet that he can be so many things to so many people. I don't know what else I should say. You have to say something. Please. I have to, wait, I had a note here. Go ahead. No. <laughs> But Stanley, you've, you've read this. Well, a couple of times. Right. But I was going to say what you're talking about in terms of his relationship to the reader. Uh, I can't think of a poet, certainly in his generation, who was more intimate with the reader. And the reader felt that. Um, 
there's always a sense that, of separation, uh, like the proscenium stage in most uh, uh, relations between the poet and the reader. But he, he transcended that uh, in very powerful ways. And what you were saying about Martin's Ferry uh, is the gravitas in, in those poems, uh, uh, both the pain and the, and the, the needfulness that you feel all the time in Wright's work. Um, the great thing about Jonathan's biography uh, is that it's full of judgment without judging Wright's life. Uh, and he was a man in considerable pain much of the time, psychologically and spiritually. Uh, the writing and the drinking and the smoking seem to be cyclical and uh, one depending on the other. Uh, uh, and the price you pay for that is obvious since he dies in 53. Um, 52. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse than we thought. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know a little of this area. I was born here. I was born in Bar Belmont County in Barnesville, a little Quaker town up, up county that my family helped found. So uh, I didn't spend much time there, uh, 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 except in summers as a kid, because uh, all my fathers before me on my father's side had been born in this town. So my mother went there precisely to have me, uh, uh, I guess to continue the line of what ends with me, since I've never had children. Um, but that's a sad story that none of us wants to hear. <laughs> uh, but Wright, um, Wright brings a whole different sense of what a poem is, I think, uh, at that moment where he breaks with, uh, and John does a wonderful job, I think, of, of making that, that line, that demarcation clear. And he breaks with the tradition that was obsessing him and possessing him uh, the poems of E.A. Robinson, uh, the, what, what we think of now as a classical kind of uh, formal verse uh, to what happens in the branch will not break. I don't think Wright ever saw that in any absolute terms. And the reason he didn't, uh, as he moves from that formalist to the great, this is a terrible phrase, this free verse phrase, but to the great free verse poet that he became, uh, is that he didn't see that change in any less formal terms. Um, he had a profound ear, and uh, you, you, if you listen to those open, we'll call them open form poems, they are no less musical uh, than poems that uh, keep the measure and, and, and maintain the beat. Uh, it's just that the rhythm is different. But uh, he's a marvelous maker of sentences, uh, which is really the prosody that you need in football free verse. Um, uh, I'm curious what it was like to read with him. Uh, what was your experience of, of hearing him read and, and uh, sharing the stage with him? Well, I read with him uh, in Ohio, and I never talking about that. And I realized one, one of the other times was at that wonderful uh, uh, smart reading uh, at the church in New York, where mm -hmm. a bunch of us read. This was in uh, February of 1978, and there was a great gathering organized by Galway Canal and Betty, Betty Craig. Betty Craig. And, and it was uh, in celebration of, of the, uh, what is the 17th century? Christopher yeah, Smart. Right, right. And you have uh, a lot to add. No. There's a long poem that he's that one of his, his most famous poem. And, and there was a group reading where, where you took stands and so you each shared, read one stanza after all these well, poets. Well, uh, you know, Wright was a, uh, understood understood the line and, and the, uh, the line break in his, in his poems beautifully. And so that you really hear that sense, uh, not of, of, we were talking earlier, not of declamation, but of understanding of how that poem should be paced, and how it should move, and how it should undulate, and how it should begin, and how it should move through its middle, and arrive at a certain place. Uh, but the right is a marvel of ending poems, and they'll often turn to the reader and say something 
basically, are you really listening? <laughs> uh, the implicit question. Uh, and, and the there's a wonderful, you mentioned Muriel, there's a wonderful moment in that, uh, in that uh, reading. Uh, Galway has a poem about this, in fact. And uh, Muriel Lukas is the uh, senior poet, I think, at that moment. And she's quite elderly. Uh, we each have about 10 minutes. I don't know, there are more than a dozen of us, so it's, it's quite an event. Um, and uh, she's in her bedroom slippers and her house dress. <laughs> uh, and she's near the end, I think she may be the last poet uh, in recognition of her stature. And uh, there's a podium that we each get up from the pews and you know, do our thing. Uh, she goes up, she's not a tall woman. She was, uh, when I'm not being sexist, when I say she was a bit round. <laughs> uh, and so she's, the, the podium is sort of at eye height. And she starts her, her segment. She's reading beautifully. Uh, she has her hands on either side of the podium. And we begin to notice as she's reading that she's also sinking. <laughs> And she's sinking even more as she goes along. And she, her elbows start to go out like wings. <laughs> uh, and her knees begin to go down. <laughs> and it looks like a disaster is about to occur. Galway rushes up onto the stage, lifts her by the elbow. <laughs> and it's as if no one notices this. But she keeps right on going. <laughs> that was a masterful moment. Um, uh, and, uh, no one laughed though, that, or, or even you know said anything at, that, uh, at, at the event itself. We'll be talking about it later. Um, another story. I hope I'm not talking too much, but I want to tell the story uh, about Fano, Fano, Italy, where. Uh, Annie and uh, James spent uh, a good bit of time, uh, and uh, the town, uh, he dedicates his last book to, to the town. To the, yeah. uh, where you were both saved, or we words well. that effect. We got well. Yeah, <laughs> got well. Fano um, is a former, actually, fishing village. Fano means uh, fortune of fortune in Italian. It's from the Adriatic. It's actually a, a kind of a small medieval town. Uh, it isn't, uh, yeah, it's, it's not uh, a town uh, that uh, is high on the visitors list, but Italians go there. Uh, there's a kind of arcade atmosphere on near the beach, and, and the, the ocean is incredibly safe there. It's like a great lake. You can walk out forever and end up at waist high. Um, well, not too long after James's uh, death, the Poetry Society of America decides to go there. Why, I'm not quite sure. Um, and there are about a half a dozen of us, uh, Yusuf Kuniata, Bob Haas, uh, Heather McHugh, myself, Bill Matthews, and Deborah Biggs. And I think Dana Joy was in the group too who's the only one who had a vague sense of Italian. Um, but the whole, the, the, the fiction of the trip was that we were going to translate. Um, which was, and they had the, the equivalent number of poets over there waiting for us. And we met in this wonderful church. There were pictures of this with great floral uh, display all around us. It was, uh, it was an excuse to go there, obviously. Um, and uh, I just published a, a long essay in the American Poetry Review, so I was picked to, to give the inaugural uh, uh, talk to everyone. Uh, and I wrote this kind of ponderous, uh, probably really boring piece. Um, and, but the problem with it was that after every paragraph, it had to be translated. So it just became, <laughs> everyone, it was just incredibly painful uh, for all of us. So I cut it short, but I did add a paragraph at the end, uh, uh, spontaneously, uh, when I had notes to that effect in the piece, in which I mentioned Fano's meaning to James Wright. 
uh, and to Annie and the time they spent there and the fact that his last book uh, was dedicated to this little Italian city. I even read a poem from that book. And afterwards, the city fathers come up to me and ha they have no clue about this. They didn't know who James Wright was, in terms of, except in his poetry, but that he'd spent any time there. Uh, and they were not only flabbergasted, but I think embarrassed. So I was thinking, what's the street on your poem? James Wright right right way. <laughs> in Fano today, there is a Via James Wright. <laughs> <laughs> After that, um, that I knew they were supposed to be, and we went. We went to the next one. It's there. It's very small. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of streets in Italy are small. So. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the, the, the biography is uh, biographies are impossible. There are professional biographers. Uh, who seem to make a living and do make a living uh, visiting uh, famous figures and whatnot and uh, finding a new fact and basing uh, an entire biography on the fact that they've discovered it. <coughs> uh, but this is the first foray. I don't know if there will be others. This is the first foray. This is the evidence that uh, is incontrovertible in a way that what, what you feel in this book is its truth. It, it's, uh, I think the word was honesty uh, earlier. Uh, but also it's equanimity. It, it, it has incredible balance in it. And you just move along through this life and you're wondering how on earth is this man going to make it? I don't mean Jonathan. <laughs> um, and the other thing from the writer's point of view, uh, that is to say the biographer's point of view, is sustainability. How do you sustain this tone? How do you sustain this momentum? Uh, how do you keep that kind of, of uh, energy going without falling prey to, uh, referring earlier to judgment, uh, and to uh, questions? that cannot be answered. Uh, uh, you really feel the full life and the full report uh, given to us with uh, uh, judiciousness and actually generosity. Uh, so the, the, the writer of this book is to be congratulated Absolutely. for a phenomenal job. to that, that um, I've, I've read a number of biographies of poets and writers, and this one to me, since Wright was uh, a Dickensian in some ways, had the feel of a Charles Dickens novel, yeah. mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I wanted to know what was going on, and I admired tremendously the discussion of the poems, but I also wanted to know what's going to happen. And it felt like when I first read Little Mel, you know, I had to my lunch, but I got to go back to see what's going to happen. And I read it that way the first time. It slowly, but it's, it's quite a literary accomplishment, as well as uh, the precision. And the, I can't even imagine how one would write a biography. I can't even if I had known. <laughs> no, but, but for all the time that I did spend writing this book, there's not a moment that I regret spending in the company of James Wright. He really is that complex and that fascinating a character. It's, it's, it was constantly fulfilling to me to find the next draft and to see how the poems came together. It was, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible uh, story. I mean, I, I felt an obligation to all of you in a sense. I mean, because I've been coming to this festival for, oh, at least the last 10 least from the from the tenth festival, I came. You know the the final uh, ten festivals that we came here. And I was record. I've done a lot of the recordings I made here are are part of that deep research that goes into the book because uh, um, so many poets have spoken here, Stanley and Maggie certainly among them, who understand the poems in in different ways there's different as you said there are different james rights personal james rights that, that people understand but all of those different 
angles and perspectives on this work are, are important for, for telling a rounded story. Um, and I didn't feel like I needed to come up with a story. I mean, the life itself is, is, uh, is story enough. The importance, the, the importance I felt was to keep James Wright's voice in the book and alive in the book. And, and I gathered all of the extant recordings of him that, that, that I could get my hands on. And a lot of those, a lot of the stories about the poem, the genesis of particular poems can be, he would tell stories often about the poems before he read them. <coughs> so those are very rich documents. But, but even more important is the sound of his voice, the cadence of his voice, the having, carrying, carrying that voice around in my head made a, made a big difference. Is that native Ohio one? <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? Oh, <laughs> Jonathan, questions from the audience? Yes. Jonathan, uh, Jim Bodine from uh, out in the Northwest. Uh, the, uh, represent the work that you did on, uh, in researching uh, right in Seattle and the interviews, you must have spent a lot of time with Franz Snyder. Uh, I did, yes. Yes, yes, that was a very important interview. Franz Schneider, a, a, a fellow graduate student at the University of Washington, yes. when, was, when, when James was studying with Peter Repke. So my, my question really is about the, the relationship between James Wright and uh, Richard Hugo. I, I, I think that they, they seem very simpatico to me, and uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, on their relationship a bit. That was one of the most important relationships he had in Seattle when, when he and his first wife were living there. Uh, they had Franz Wright was a, was a young child in, from an infant, really. Um, he was, I guess, six months old when they first moved to Washington State. Um, but, but Richard Hugo uh, was among James's closest friends for the four years that he was living there. Um, they had an immediate rapport. Uh, Hugo, of course, had also studied with Redke. They weren't in classes together, but, but Hugo knew, was good friends with Redke. And, and the friendship that, that James developed with Theodore Redke uh, was, was almost as important to him as the, the learning he did as a student of Redke's. Uh, of course, Stanley Kunitz was there as well for a year, and, and James Wright learned a great deal from him. But the friendship that, that persisted uh, between James and Richard Hugo had a great deal to do with their, their personal backgrounds. Um, as, uh, I mean, I used the, James Wright hated this phrase, and so I always hesitate to use it, but working class. Um, uh, in, in a sense, Philip Levine would be a, a, a kind of member of that cadre of poets, and when, and when, um, when James went to the White House uh, before the week before he entered the hospital, this was in January of 1980, his last appearance in public before uh, going into the Mount Sinai in New York, um, he saw Philip Levine and Richard Hugo together, and the three of them embraced for the final time then. Um, it was the last time he saw Hugo. and. He put up a good show of, of saying, I'm going to beat this thing. He knew he was sick then. He knew he had cancer. He had only just been diagnosed the month before. But after, this is something that Phil Levine shared with me. After James walked away, Richard Hugo broke down in tears. And he said, Phil, what are we going to do? There were only the three of us writing this kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. And Phil Levine tried to encourage him and say, no, Jim looks strong. He'll be, you know, he's going to fight this thing. But in a sense, there was that, you know, they were also drinking companions, and that's a whole other, that's a whole other, you know. We, we don't have enough time to talk about that, but, um, but I think, honestly, their, their friendship was, was rooted in that shared experience of, of, of their childhoods and, and, and growing up and their fathers being working men in factories. And, and I think that was, that was the heart of, of what they shared in, in their poetry and in their friendship. Another question? Can we, can, did you want to speak first? Just a few minutes. Yeah. Seconds. Um, first of all, Stanley, I'm glad, um, glad you mentioned Fano. You're going to hear more about Fano from me later on. 
And I never knew that the Poetry Society went there. Probably just as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but second, uh, although James White left Martin's Ferry, never came back to visit, he, it was with him day and night, always. We'd be having a conversation about, oh, anything, say, New York or something, and he'd suddenly break in with a story about someone he knew in Martin Sperry. And it was, it, was, it was like he carried Martin Sperry with him on his back all, all the rest of his life. With a lot of people don't feel it was with love, but I disagree. It was with uh, it was tough love, tough love. And um, speaking of Richard Hugo, who was a wonderful friend and uh, who I knew also, he wrote a poem called Second Chance, about his second chance. And I feel that Jonathan, in his last <coughs> part of the book, talks about James Wright's second chance so beautifully. And a lot of people sort of act as if once he left Minnesota in a certain amount of disgrace, that was the end. But it wasn't the end. And he did have a second chance. And he did, he did everything possible to take advantage of it. He cool. was... Galway has a wonderful poem, Elegy for uh, yes, him that's and a uh, Hugo. Yes. They're both named in the title of that poem. Um, I, I think it was 1980, I held the Theodore Rethke Chair at the University of Washington, and uh, Dick was, uh, I knew Hugo very well, uh, Dick was going to the hospital that year in Seattle. Uh, he was also a heavy smoker. He was about to have a lung removed. Uh, so we saw a good bit of him in the hospital that year. And that was the year. Uh, I found that interesting because that's the same year uh, James died. Yes. Uh, and there, Hugo was, uh, it, it, it was very touch and go. And he died not long after not that, right. uh, yes. after that operation. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if I agree that Phil is in that company as a poet, I have to say, and I, and I do feel very well. Uh, not as a, an artist, I mean, but in terms of, of um, the, the kind of writing, getting, the kind of poem getting done, what you hear in Hugo and, 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 and in uh, Wright's work is a powerful and compelling vulnerability. I don't get that in Phil's. I find an aggression, uh, an anger, and he's, he, he wins too much, I think, in his poem. Uh, but the great thing about Hugo and, and uh, Wright is they are perennial losers. Uh, and that, oh, that's powerful. Uh, if you think you're going to, poetry's not about victory. It's about the opposite of victory. And that, that's its charm and its uh, ability to, to stay with us. Uh, and these losses uh, are so powerful in James's work. They add up. If you, read, you, you can't go, an exercise in, I don't know what, but you could go through uh, the collected poems on a sort of ongoing basis. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily have to read every poem, but but keep that momentum going as a reader. Uh, and to, it would be exhausting but exhilarating at the same time uh, because you, you feel you're, you're more alive, at, you be more alive at the end of that process uh, and more filled, you know, the cup would be running over. Did you have questions? Yes. So um, I came of age with, when Robert Bly had a lot of the more polemical essays and um, people were focused on the branch will not break. And then um, I think in the journey I read <coughs> May morning and realized that it was kind of a sonnet but it looked like prose and, and I've read and loved Edward Thomas and this other James Wright that was more of a stem from Edward Thomas and Robert Frost even in the characters that he loved to, to, to try to capture came more alive. Right now, could you comment on 
other James Wrights that have become more alive for you or poems that you are really fascinated right now that maybe you you didn't see as clearly during the, the 60s when everything was so politicized <coughs> and there were camps here and camps there and what, what, what occurs to me immediately is that James Wright did not join up into any camp. I mean, it's one of the distinguishing features of his entire career. When, when he was at, at the University of Washington and, and the new critical uh, dimension was, was, was fully in, in vogue, he, he insisted on, on taking a back seat. You know, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't sign up for any group, uh, really. I mean, the whole, the whole canard about Robert Bly and James Wright being deep image poets, was something which, which drove him to distraction. And, and, uh, and he, when he got together with, with uh, W.S. Merwin, Bill Merwin, in the, in the 1960s, and they would, they would be reciting poems to each other, it would be Alexander Pope and, and Thomas Hardy. <laughs> These were the poems that they loved to challenge each other to see who knew more poems by heart. By the, you know, the, it's, he, he loved poems no matter where they came from. If, if a student wrote one good line in a poem, he would point to that line and say, that's a great line of poetry. I mean, that's, he, he loved poems wherever he found them. And, and, and so the whole idea that there were schools of poetry, I think, kind of left him cold. One of the most remarkable things I, 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 I still think about, at the end of his life, he reached a level, he, he became sober, for one, for one thing, and in, in, the, in the final great period of his writing life, it didn't matter to him, in a sense, whether he was writing in prose or whether he was writing in a line break poem. And there's an incredible fluidity of movement between those two forms. He would start drafting a poem in line breaks, and he would go back to the poem. I'm not saying he went back to the poem as a printed piece. He would remember, it's like, oh, I was working on this poem. He would, he would rewrite the poem entirely in prose from memory. He wouldn't work for old drafts. This is, this is what, I mean, in his earlier life, he, he meticulously numbered his drafts so you could follow the, the progression of a poem. At the end of his life, he was, especially in the, the last, this journey, the poems that came out posthumously, he was incredibly capable of writing perfectly the first time. A lot of those poems are directly out of his journal. Now, Annie has shared with me that he was working on these poems in his head a lot before they ever got written down on the page. But that, that ability to move back and forth, it was what Stanley was mentioning before about the sense of the, of the sentence as structure. Um, he reached a place in his late career where it felt like he could do no wrong. The, the last journals that he was keeping in the final year of his life are, are absolutely phenomenal. And I would love to see a book. Uh, of, uh, Annie has made some a brief selection of those uh, journal passages. But the, the complete journal itself is, is really astonishing, really wonderful. So there's this great, wonderful flowering at the end of his life. The great sadness I still feel is that, that he was just beginning that new phase in his work. And so, as Galway Cannell insisted, the next book would have been even better. The next book would have been incredible. So, does, I don't know, did I answer your question? Sure. Yeah, just one, one, so, in your journey, what are a couple poems right now that you would go back to because they're just newly fascinating to you? More recently, they've become more fascinating to you. Well, that's a difficult question. I, I, I mean, I, I'm still fascinated by, by his, um, what he saw in the prose form that he felt like he hadn't gotten to yet. And so in a certain way, I keep going back to those, what he insisted on calling prose pieces. He wanted to distinguish them. They were, they were not prose poems. He wanted to learn how to write good, clear English. And there's, there's, in, there's intention behind those prose pieces that, that still fascinate me, that, that I wanted to, I, I can still feel like he was moving in a direction that he hadn't gotten to yet. There was some talk, uh, you, you spoke, Annie spoke with his uh, 
psychiatrist, and and he had uh, confessed that he was working towards a novel. Yes. Wow. Mm. There's no evidence of this in his papers. Many of his papers were destroyed at the end of his life. You mentioned. Yeah, I went through everything after his death, and his desk, his briefcase, and he showed me just see I'm working on a novel, but that was gone. He did. You know, he was always growing. That's, that's yeah. what you're saying. Uh, now there was a price to pay too. These were these were not pain, uh, unpainful transitions. He was uh, uh, in some anxiety about where, where his work was going and its value. And so he was. Uh, his greatness depends on a lot. Uh, it seems to me on his willingness to test uh, that future, so that the branch will not break and. Shall we gather at the river? I think uh, are a kind of separate moment, and then we have that collected early collected poem. Uh, then there are new poems from from that as a in the complete uh, poem uh, as a separate category. But a poem that strikes me before he gets to two citizens and his new life with uh, Annie uh, is that last poem, Northern Pike. That is an extraordinary piece of writing, and. The person who first recommended that poem to me is the most unlikely uh, sponsor of such a poem uh, in every possible way, aesthetically and uh, I don't know, personally, I suppose. And that was Richard Howard. Oh, yes. He absolutely loved that poem. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll read it uh, later today when we do the reading. Uh, but I think that's a watershed, that poem. Uh, to speak directly to your question. Uh, then he goes into those first pieces in the collected, which is a kind of anthology of uh, a narrative of how uh, he moves through those final uh, poems in, in uh, this journey, which is a, just a masterpiece of ease. You just feel the naturalness of the writing. This is what Lowell was really talking about. As if it, as if every waking moment is just giving us this language in these forms, uh, in these new poems. Uh, that last poem, uh, Winter Daybreak Above Men, is incredible. Uh, and you also have to look at the arrangement of the forms in the book. He's paying attention to them, speaking of the novelist, uh, of them as a kind of implicit narrative, an, an emotional uh, art from the <coughs> beginning to the end. Uh, Just as a little uh, insight into our library, in James Wright's uh, volume of Collected Poems by Edward Thomas, he has written in the flyleaf, this is the book I love best. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, Edward Thomas is the man who couldn't make up his mind. Uh, Road Not Taken is an Edward Thomas poem. It's about Edward Thomas. Right. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd buy Frost and Wright. E. A. Robinson and Thomas, yes. Because Frost is too tricky. He's such a liar. Uh, uh, in, the, in the very best sense. Uh, what does Picasso say? Art is the lie that tells the truth. That's Robert Frost. <laughs> Born in San Francisco, he was a Californian, mm -hmm. learns to be Robert Frost. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Question? Yes. Yeah, how did, uh, what was White's uh, attachment to Leslie Marm and Soko? How did they meet? Oh, they met at a conference in Michigan, and uh, they, they, they liked each other's work, but I think it was two or three years later, <coughs> we were in Rhode Island spending a month, and we found in a bookstore Leslie Mormon Sunkel's book, Ceremony. Mm -hmm. And he, we read it both on the beach, and he was so taken with it that he renewed their uh, acquaintanceship and started writing to her. Right. And their first letters are very formal, Dear Miss Silco, right. Dear yeah. Mr. Wright. <coughs> and then suddenly, Leslie breaks it, and her letters were magnificent. 
Did they ever read together? They never read together. Yeah. yeah. They seem so, so, so opposite. Yeah. Is that uh, Robert the Black guy? Yeah. <laughs> they stand. <Okay. laughs> <laughs> Leslie said she never ever had a correspondence like that again. That's it's a beautiful book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you don't know this book we're speaking of, it's called The Delicacy and Strength of Lace. It's one of the most beautiful collections of both sides of that correspondence. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, it's a it's a miraculous little book and, and, it, and I recommend it to you with all my heart. I um, um, it's it's incredibly rich with with um, just life experience. It's a it's a beautiful book. And it's it's a book that Annie had edited for Grey Wolf Press and it's still in print. It's never been out of print. It's a, it's in a fact, they had a reissue of it with a different cover. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I made a note of that you quote. Jonathan, the biography is a letter from from Leslie Silco, in which she said to James Wright, "You are fearless of the language America speaks, and you love it." And I, I just thought that was such a. The other thing I wanted to say, just uh, I hope I can say this um, as well as I would like to. One of the things I admire about the life of James Wright, as I came to know it through Jonathan's book and through knowing Annie for a long time, is he had. Um, amazingly open friendships with women all, all his life. And I, I think it's, you know, because his professional life was so occupied with men, and you always think of James Wright and Richard Hugo and W.S. Merlin and all of that, I, I think one of the things that um, makes me sadder than I am, that I never met him, is that I think he had a wonderful sensitivity, especially to women writers, who really recognized something in women writers that at that time many men were not even thinking about. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. I want to add too that uh, uh, you mentioned the language. Uh, the only uh, the American writer comes closest to write in his understanding of uh, the American idiom, it seems to me, uh, in that really powerful way, it's Sherwood Anderson. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't know his, uh, especially short stories, uh, they're phenomenal. The interesting thing is that Anderson is credited by both Faulkner and Hemingway as a mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are great American naturalist writers. So, uh, Wright used to say, they, they keep calling me a romantic, but I, I'm. Uh, Maybe content, but I'm a classicist in form. <laughs> uh, but I think he was an American naturalist. Because yeah, there's, there's great realism and tragedy in, in the poems, and yet it's all elevated uh, in a very sublime way. Yes? I had a question for Annie, and then the... the entirety of the panel. Uh, did James have any uh, particular lines that were his favorites from any of his work that he might recite or uh, recall and do and he seems like he influenced so many people that uh, does the panel have any lines and influential poets have great lines and I wondered if the panel have thought of any or can recall any that are their favorites that uh, have particular meaning for them? I would say probably if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossoms. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was a, a favorite line. Yeah. What occurs to me is that he would be less likely to quote his own poems yeah. mm -hmm. than, than mm -hmm. any thousands of others that, that he carried around with him everywhere. I so it was what unlikely for him to quote. Himself. Yeah, his own stuff. Yeah. One of the, one of his great favorites was was Pablo Neruda's poem "Walking Around." Oh, he mm -hmm. could recite that. Yeah, and he, and he heard that many times uh, as they walked around together in New York City. Uh, yeah, I, I, what from your question? That's what springs to my mind mm -hmm. is the number of the, the particular poems that he recited most often. Uh, at readings and, and 
What about you, Jonathan? Is there a line from his work that resonates for you? Did you um, come back to? Well, one that sticks that never leaves me, and it's you know has to do with uh, his being from Martin's Ferry in the river, and and, and the book uh, is uh, one fainting strand of spider web. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. it's always with me. Yeah, I, 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 it's from, that's why I named the book. That I thought that because that of that, that's yeah. that thing. Fainting, that's the word. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. That, that's where he won that line. <coughs> I, you know, Tom, I don't, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I think of particular poems more than I think of particular lines. I think the poems carry uh, a whole world to me. Um, there's, there's a, there's a poem that I've been reading at other venues um, that's become. One of one of my great favorites, and that's as I step over a puddle at the end of winter, I think of an ancient Chinese governor, and and there's this affinity that he had with Bachui you know, from from the what the seventh century Tang Dynasty. There's 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 something about particular poets who called him out in a sense like there's 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 a, there's an affinity that he recognized I, I feel it also with with uh, Lorca there they, they called out different different aspects of, of his poetic character in a sense uh, Edward Thomas certainly uh, and so there's there's a way in which these, these other poets that he loved um, spoke to him in very particular ways and there and, and that's a fascination to me endlessly uh, is the way in which these poems that he loved called up parts of his being in a sense um, so there's a multifaceted way that that different poems seem to affect him that's a, that's a, that's my personal experience thank you lines from right that resonate with you I was going to say, it's funny because it's what came to me immediately is the beginning of the poem at the executed murderer's grave. Mm -hmm. And I, I think those lines, which I'll just say because some of you may not know them, my name is James A. Wright and I was born 25 miles from this infected grave in Martins Ferry, Ohio, where one slave to Hazel Atlas Glass became my father. He tried to teach me kindness. And I think for me, as a poet, there's somebody just saying that, coming out like that, just like regular speech, like American speech, this is where I, this is who I am, this is where I'm from, this is what my father did. And then to realize also that it's in rhyme iambic container was like a kind of a revelation to me when I first read it. I thought, what a genius to talk like that that way. Stanley? He's the kind of poet who writes quotable lines, uh, except early on. And, uh, all, all what's been remarked on here is in meter, uh, and that meter is part of the memory uh, based on the poem. Uh, but he moved uh, in, in the important sense in Branch Will Not Break to a different, whole different idiom of, of, of making the poem. Uh, it almost resists that kind of quotability. Uh, you do have to see the whole, the gestalt, the poem as a whole, and read it that way. And so I, I don't think it's a particular line that, uh, uh, that interests me uh, ever in Wright's work. Uh, and I can think of a lot of other poets where that's not true, uh, who are lesser poets, frankly. Uh, Lines to live by, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, what about you? Well, I, I know when I first went to my first poetry reading by James Wright, he read Lion and Hammond, and I heard those lines, I have wasted my life. I thought, I'm going to do something. <laughs> <laughs> And you did, didn't you? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>